Pedro de Alvarado y Contreras Spanish pronunciation, Peo y al Beta Aeo, Badajoz, Extremadura, Spain, ca. 1485 Guadalajara, New Spain, 4 July 1541 was a Spanish conquistador and governor of Guatemala. He participated in the conquest of Cuba, in Juan de Grijalva's exploration of the coasts of the Yucatán Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico, and in the conquest of Mexico led by Hernán Cortés. He is considered the conquistador of much of Central America, including Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador. Although renowned for his skill as a soldier, Alvarado is known also for the cruelty of his treatment of native populations, and mass murders committed in the subjugation of the native peoples of Mexico. Historiography portrays that indigenous people, both Nahuatl speakers and speakers of other languages, called him Tonatia, meaning son, in the Nahuatl language. Yet he was also called Red Son in Nahuatl, which allows a variety of interpretations. Whether this epithet refers to Alvarado's red hair, some esoteric quality attributed to him, or both, is disputed. Topic. Character and appearance Pedro de Alvarado was flamboyant and charismatic, and was both a brilliant military commander and a cruel, hardened man. His hair and beard were blonde, which earned him the name of Tonatia from the Aztecs, the name of one of their sun gods since the fourth sun god had been took over by Tonatia. Like Pedro took over the Aztecs. He was handsome, and presented an affable appearance, but was volatile and quick to anger. He was ruthless in his dealings with the indigenous peoples he set out to conquer. Historians judge that his greed drove him to excessive cruelty, and his Spanish contemporaries denounced his extreme brutality during his lifetime. He was a poor governor of territories he had conquered, and restlessly sought out new adventures. His tactical brutality, such as the massacre in the Great Temple of Tenochtitlan, often undermined strategic considerations. He was also accused of cruelty against fellow Spaniards. Alvarado was little suited to govern. When he held governing positions, he did little to establish stable foundations for colonial rule. His letters show no interest in civil matters, and he only discussed exploration and war. Alvarado stubbornly resisted attempts by the Spanish crown to establish ordered taxation in Guatemala, and refused to acknowledge such attempts. As governor of Guatemala, Alvarado has been described by W. George Lovell et al. as an insatiable despot who recognized no authority but his own and who regarded Guatemala as little more than his personal estate. American historian William H. Prescott described Alvarado's character in the following terms. Alvarado was a cavalier of high family, gallant and chivalrous, and Cortes warm personal friend. He had talents for action, was possessed of firmness and intrepidity, while his frank and dazzling manners made the Tonatia an especial favorite with the Mexicans. But, underneath this showy exterior, the future conqueror of Guatemala concealed a heart rash, rapacious, and cruel. He was altogether destitute of that moderation, which, in the delicate position he occupied, was a quality of more worth than all the rest. Spanish chronicler Antonio de Remesel commented that, Alvarado desired more to be feared than loved by his subjects, whether they were Indians or Spaniards. In his easy recourse to violence, Alvarado was a product of his time, and Alvarado was not the only conquistador to have resorted to such actions. Hernán Cortés and Francisco Pizarro carried out deeds of similar cruelty, but have not attracted as much criticism as Alvarado. Topic. Early life and family Pedro de Alvarado was born in 1485 in the town of Badajoz, Extremadura. His father was Gómez de Alvarado, and his mother was Leonor de Contreras, Gómez's second wife. Pedro de Alvarado had a twin sister, Sara, and four full blood brothers, Jorge, Gonzalo, Gómez, and Juan. Pedro had an illegitimate half-brother, also named Juan, referred to in contemporary sources as Juan el Bastardo. Very little is known of Pedro de Alvarado's early life before his arrival in the Americas. During the conquest of the Americas, tales of his youthful exploits in Spain became popular legends, but their veracity is doubtful. An example is the tale then current that when he was a youth awaiting passage to the Americas, he climbed the church tower in Seville with some friends. A banner pole extended some 3.0 to 3.7 meters 10 to 12 feet from an upper window. One of his companions walked out to the end of the pole after removing his cloak and sword, and returned to the tower backwards. 
Alvarado, afraid of being mocked, walked out onto the pole with both sword and cloak, and turned around at the end to return to the tower facing it. Alvarado's paternal grandfather was Juan Alvarado, El Viejo, the Elder, who was Commendador of Hornachos, and his paternal grandmother was Catalina Messia. Pedro de Alvarado's uncle on his father's side was Diego de Alvarado y Messia, who was the Commendador of Laban, Puebla, and Montillo, Alcalde of Montanches, and Lord of Castellanos and of Cubalana. Diego was a veteran of the campaigns against the Moors. <laughs> First campaigns in the Americas Alvarado and his brothers crossed the Atlantic Ocean before 1511, possibly in 1510. By 1511 a system of licenses had been established in Spain to control the flow of colonists to the New World. The only one of the Alvarado brothers that appears in the registers is Juan de Alvarado, in 1511, leading to the assumption that the rest were already in the Americas by the time the licensing system was established. The Alvarado brothers stopped off at Hispaniola, but there are few mentions of their stay there in historical documents. Soon after arriving in Santo Domingo, on Hispaniola, Pedro de Alvarado established a friendship with Hernán Cortés, who at the time was serving as public scribe. Alvarado joined Cortés to participate in the conquest of Cuba, under the command of Diego de Velázquez. The conquest of Cuba was launched in 1511, and Pedro de Alvarado was accompanied by his brothers. Soon after the invasion, Alvarado was managing a prosperous hacienda in the new colony. It is around this time that Pedro de Alvarado emerges into the historical record as a prosperous and influential hacienda owner, already well connected with Velázquez, who was now governor of Cuba. <laughs> Grijalva Expedition, 1518 Diego Velázquez, the governor of Cuba, was enthused by Francisco Hernández de Córdoba's report of gold in the newly discovered Yucatán Peninsula. He organized an expedition consisting of four ships and 260 men. He placed his nephew Juan de Grijalva in overall command, Pedro de Alvarado captained one of the ships. The small fleet was stocked with crossbows, muskets, barter goods, salted pork, and cassava bread. The fleet left Cuba in April 1518 and made its first landfall upon the island of Cozumel, off the east coast of Yucatan. The Maya inhabitants of Cozumel fled the Spanish. The fleet then sailed south from Cozumel, along the east coast of the peninsula. The Spanish spotted three large Maya cities along the coast. On Ascension Thursday, the fleet discovered a large bay, which the Spanish named Bahia de la Ascension. Grijalva did not land at any of these cities and turned back north to loop around the north of the Yucatán Peninsula and sail down the west coast. At Campeche the Spanish opened fire against the city with small cannon, the inhabitants fled, allowing the Spanish to take the abandoned city. The Maya remained hidden in the forest, so the Spanish boarded their ships and continued along the coast. At Champotan, the fleet was approached by a small number of large war canoes, but the ship's cannon soon put them to flight. At the mouth of the Tabasco River the Spanish sighted massed warriors and canoes but the natives did not approach. By means of interpreters, Grijalva indicated that he wished to trade and bartered wine and beads in exchange for food and other supplies. From the natives they received a few gold trinkets and news of the riches of the Aztec Empire to the west. The expedition continued far enough to confirm the reality of the gold-rich empire, sailing as far north as Panuco River. At the Papaloapan River, Alvarado ordered his ship upriver, leaving the rest of the small fleet behind to wait for him at the river mouth. This action greatly angered Grijalva, who feared that a lone ship could be lost. After this, the Spanish referred to the river as the Rio de Alvarado, Alvarado's River. A little further along the coast, the fleet encountered settlements under Aztec dominion, and was met by Aztec emissaries with gifts of gold and jewels sent by the Emperor Moctezuma II. As punishment for entering the Papaloapan River without orders, Grijalva sent Alvarado with the ship San Sebastián to relay news of the discoveries back to Cuba. Alvarado made a triumphal entry to Santiago de Cuba, with a great display of the wealth that had been gained from the expedition. His early arrival in Cuba allowed him to ingratiate himself with the governor Velázquez before Grijalva's return. The rest of the fleet put into the port of Havana five months after it had left. Grijalva was coldly received by the governor, who Alvarado had turned against him, claiming much of the glory of the expedition for himself. Topic. Expedition to Mexico, 1519 
Grijalva's return aroused great interest in Cuba. A new expedition was organized, with a fleet of eleven ships carrying 500 men and some horses. Hernán Cortés was placed in command, Pedro de Alvarado and his brothers Jorge, Gómez and Juan El Bastardo joined the expedition. Cortés charged Pedro de Alvarado with gathering recruits from the inland estates of Cuba. The crew included officers that would become famous conquistadors, including Cristóbal de Olid, Gonzalo de Sandoval and Diego de Ordaz. Also aboard were Francisco de Montejo and Bernal Díaz del Castillo, veterans of the Grijalva expedition. Alvarado once again commanded the San Sebastian, with 60 men under his orders. The fleet made its first landfall at Cozumel, and remained there for several days. Maya temples were cast down and a Christian cross was put up on one of them. From Cozumel, the fleet looped around the north of the Yucatan Peninsula and followed the coast to the Tabasco River. In Tabasco, the fleet anchored at Patanchan, a Chantal Maya town. The Maya prepared for battle but the Spanish horses and firearms quickly decided the outcome. From Tabasco, the fleet continued to Sempoala in Veracruz, a subject city of the Aztec Empire, and from there went on to conquer the Aztecs. Alvarado commanded one of the eleven vessels in the fleet and also acting as Cortés second in command during the expedition's first stay in the Aztec capital city of Tenochtitlan. Relations between the Spaniards and their hosts were uneasy, especially given Cortés' repeated insistence that the Aztecs desist from idol worship and human sacrifice. In order to ensure their own safety, the Spaniards took the Aztec king Moctezuma hostage. When Cortés returned to the Gulf Coast to deal with the newly arrived hostile expedition of Panfilo de Narváez, Alvarado remained in Tenochtitlan as commander of the Spanish enclave, with strict orders to make sure that Moctezuma not be permitted to escape. During Cortés' absence, relations between the Spaniards and their hosts went from bad to worse, and Alvarado ordered a preemptive slaughter of Aztec nobles and priests observing a religious festival. When Cortés returned to Tenochtitlan, he found the Spanish force under siege. After Moctezuma was killed in the attempt to negotiate with his own people, the Spaniards determined to escape by fighting their way across one of the causeways that led from the city across the lake and to the mainland. In a bloody nocturnal action of 10 July 1520, known as La Noche Triste, Alvarado led the rear guard and was badly wounded. According to satirical verses by Gonzalo Ocampo, in reference to Alvarado crossing a causeway gap during the escape, Alvarado's escape became known as Salto de Alvarado. Alvarado's leap. Pedro then participated in the siege of Tenochtitlan, commanding one of four forces under Cortes. Alvarado was wounded when Guatemoc attacked all three Spanish camps on the feast day of St. John. Alvarado's company was the first to make it to the Tlatelolco marketplace, setting fire to the Aztec shrines. Cortes and Sandoval's companies joined him there after four more days of fighting. Topic. Conquest of Soconusco and Guatemala Cortés dispatched Pedro de Alvarado to invade Guatemala with 180 cavalry, 300 infantry, crossbows, muskets, four cannons, large amounts of ammunition and gunpowder, and thousands of allied Mexican warriors. Pedro de Alvarado passed through Soconusco with a sizable force in 1523, en route to conquer Guatemala. Alvarado's army included hardened veterans of the conquest of the Aztecs, and included cavalry and artillery. There were also a great many indigenous allies from Cholula, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, Tlaxcala, and Xochimilco. Alvarado was received in peace in Soconusco, and the inhabitants swore allegiance to the Spanish crown. They reported that neighboring groups in Guatemala were attacking them because of their friendly outlook towards the Spanish. Alvarado's letter to Hernán Cortés describing his passage through Soconusco is lost, and knowledge of events there come from the account of Bernal Díaz del Castillo, who was not present, but related the report of Gonzalo de Alvarado. By 1524, Soconusco had been completely pacified by Alvarado and his forces. Pedro de Alvarado and his army advanced along the Pacific coast unopposed until they reached the Samala River in western Guatemala. This region formed a part of the Quiche kingdom, and a Quiche army tried unsuccessfully to prevent the Spanish from crossing the river. Once across, the conquistadors ransacked nearby settlements in an effort to terrorize the Quiche. On 8 February 1524 Alvarado's army fought a battle at Zichalul, called Zapotitlan by his Mexican allies modern San Francisco Zapotitlan. 
Although suffering many injuries inflicted by defending Kaish archers, the Spanish and their allies stormed the town and set up camp in the marketplace. Alvarado then turned to head upriver into the Sierra Madre Mountains towards the Kaish heartlands, crossing the pass into the fertile valley of Quetzaltenango. On 12 February 1524 Alvarado's Mexican allies were ambushed in the pass and driven back by Quiche warriors but the Spanish cavalry charge that followed was a shock for the Quiche, who had never before seen horses. The cavalry scattered the Quiche and the army crossed to the city of Zelaju modern Quetzaltenango only to find it deserted. Almost a week later, on 18 February 1524, a Quiche army confronted the Spanish army in the Quetzaltenango Valley and were comprehensively defeated. Many Quiche nobles were among the dead. This battle exhausted the Quiche militarily and they asked for peace and offered tribute, inviting Pedro de Alvarado into their capital Cuamercaj, which was known as Tecpan Utatlan to the Nahuatl-speaking allies of the Spanish. Alvarado was deeply suspicious of the Quiche intentions but accepted the offer and marched to Cuamercaj with his army. In March 1524 Pedro de Alvarado entered Cuamercaj at the invitation of the remaining lords of the Quiche after their catastrophic defeat, fearing that he was entering a trap. He encamped on the plain outside the city rather than accepting lodgings inside. Fearing the great number of Quiche warriors gathered outside the city and that his cavalry would not be able to maneuver in the narrow streets of Cuamercaj, he invited the leading lords of the city, Oxab Keh the king, and Belahib Tzy the king -elect, to visit him in his camp. As soon as they did so, he seized them and kept them as prisoners in his camp. The Quiche warriors, seeing their lords taken prisoner, attacked the Spaniards' indigenous allies and managed to kill one of the Spanish soldiers. At this point Alvarado decided to have the captured Quiche lords burnt to death, and then proceeded to burn the entire city. After the destruction of Cuamercaj and the execution of its rulers, Pedro de Alvarado sent messages to Iximqui, capital of the Coxchical, proposing an alliance against the remaining Quiche resistance. Cochical alliance and conquest of the Tiziatugil On 14 April 1524, soon after the defeat of the Quiche, the Spanish were invited into Iximqui and were well received by the lords Beleje Cot and Cahi Imox. The Cochical kings provided native soldiers to assist the conquistadors against continuing Quiche resistance and to help with the defeat of the neighboring Tiziatugil kingdom. The Spanish only stayed briefly in Iximqui before continuing through Atitlan, Escuintla and Cuscatlan. The Spanish returned to the Cochical capital on 23 July 1524 and on 27 July, Pedro de Alvarado declared Iximqui as the first capital of Guatemala, Santiago de los Caballeros de Guatemala, Saint James of the Knights of Guatemala. The Cochical appear to have entered into an alliance with the Spanish to defeat their enemies, the Tiziatugil, whose capital was Tecpan Atitlan. Pedro de Alvarado sent two Cochical messengers to Tecpan Atitlan at the request of the Cochical lords, both of whom were killed by the Tiziatugil. When news of the killing of the messengers reached the Spanish at Iximqui, the conquistadors marched against the Tiziatugil with their Cochical allies. Pedro de Alvarado left Iximqui just five days after he had arrived there, with 60 cavalry, 150 Spanish infantry, and an unspecified number of Cochical warriors. The Spanish and their allies arrived at the lakeshore after a day's hard march, without encountering any opposition. Seeing the lack of resistance, Alvarado rode ahead with 30 cavalry along the lakeshore. Opposite a populated island the Spanish at last encountered hostile Tiziatugil warriors and charged among them, scattering and pursuing them to a narrow causeway across which the surviving Tiziatugil fled. The rest of Alvarado's army soon reinforced his party and they successfully stormed the island. This battle took place on 18 April, the following day the Spanish entered Tecpan Atitlan but found it deserted. Pedro de Alvarado camped in the center of the city and sent out scouts to find the enemy. They managed to catch some locals and used them to send messages to the Tiziatugil lords, ordering them to submit to the King of Spain. The Tiziatugil leaders responded by surrendering to Pedro de Alvarado and swearing loyalty to Spain, at which point Alvarado considered them pacified and returned to Iximqui. Three days after Pedro de Alvarado returned to Iximqui, the lords of the Tiziatugil arrived there to pledge their loyalty and offer tribute to the conquistadors. A short time afterwards a number of lords arrived from the Pacific lowlands to swear allegiance to the King of Spain. Cochical Rebellion 
Pedro de Alvarado rapidly began to demand gold in tribute from the Cockchicals, souring the friendship between the two peoples. He demanded that their kings deliver 1,000 gold leaves, each worth 15 pesos. The Cockchical people abandoned their city and fled to the forests and hills on 28 August 1524. Ten days later the Spanish declared war on the Cockchicle. Two years later, on 9 February 1526, a group of 16 Spanish deserters burnt the palace of the AHPO Zahal, sacked the temples and kidnapped a priest, acts that the Cockchicle blamed on Pedro de Alvarado. The Cockchicle kept up resistance against the Spanish for a number of years. On 9 May 1530, exhausted by the warfare that had seen the deaths of their best warriors and the enforced abandonment of their crops, the two kings of the most important clans returned from the wilds. A day later they were joined by many nobles and their families and many more people, they then surrendered at the new Spanish capital at Ciudad Vieja. Topic. Pacific lowlands of Guatemala On 8 May 1524, Pedro de Alvarado continued southwards to the Pacific coastal plain with an army numbering approximately 6,000, where he defeated the Pipal of Panical or Panicaltepec near Isquintepec on 9 May. Alvarado described the terrain approaching the town as very difficult, covered with dense vegetation and swampland that made the use of cavalry impossible, instead he sent men with crossbows ahead. The Pipple withdrew their scouts because of the heavy rain, believing that the Spanish and their allies would not be able to reach the town that day. Pedro de Alvarado pressed ahead and when the Spanish entered the town the defenders were completely unprepared, with the Pipple warriors indoors sheltering from the torrential rain. In the battle that ensued, the Spanish and their indigenous allies suffered minor losses but the Pipple were able to flee into the forest, sheltered from Spanish pursuit by the weather and the vegetation. Pedro de Alvarado ordered the town to be burnt and sent messengers to the Pipal lords demanding their surrender, otherwise he would lay waste to their lands. According to Alvarado's letter to Cortés, the Pipal came back to the town and submitted to him, accepting the King of Spain as their overlord. The Spanish force camped in the captured town for eight days. A few years later, in 1529, Pedro de Alvarado was accused of using excessive brutality in his conquest of Isquintepec, amongst other atrocities. In Guazacapan, Pedro de Alvarado described his encounter with people who were neither Maya nor Pipal, speaking a different language altogether, these people were probably Xinca. At this point Alvarado's force consisted of 250 Spanish infantry accompanied by 6,000 indigenous allies, mostly Cockchicle and Cholotec. Alvarado and his army defeated and occupied the most important Xinca city, named as Atiquipac. The defending warriors were described by Alvarado as engaging in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat using spears, stakes and poisoned arrows. The battle took place on 26 May 1524 and resulted in a significant reduction of the Xinca population. Alvarado's army continued eastwards from Atiquipac, seizing several more Xinca cities. Because Alvarado and his allies could not understand the Xinca language, Alvarado took extra precautions on the march eastward by strengthening his vanguard and rearguard with ten cavalry apiece. In spite of these precautions the baggage train was ambushed by a Xinca army soon after leaving Taxisco. Many indigenous allies were killed and most of the baggage was lost, including all the crossbows and ironwork for the horses. This was a serious setback and Alvarado camped his army in Nansintla for eight days, during which time he sent two expeditions against the attacking army. Alvarado sent out Xinca messengers to make contact with the enemy but they failed to return. Messengers from the city of Pazaco, in the modern department of Jutiapa, offered peace to the conquistadors but when Alvarado arrived there the next day the inhabitants were preparing for war. Alvarado's troops encountered a sizable quantity of gathered warriors and quickly routed them through the city's streets. From Pazaco, Alvarado crossed the Rio Paz and entered what is now El Salvador. Cuscatlan <laughs> El Salvador. Alvarado led the first effort by Spanish forces to extend their dominion to the nation of Cuscatlan in modern El Salvador, in June 1524. These efforts established many towns such as San Jose Acatempa in 1525 and Esquipulas in 1560. Spanish efforts were firmly resisted by the indigenous people known as the Pipal and their Mayan-speaking neighbors. 
Despite Alvarado's initial success in the Battle of Acajutla, the indigenous people of Cuscatlan, who according to tradition were led by a warlord called Atlacatl, defeated the Spaniards and their auxiliaries, and forced them to withdraw to Guatemala. Alvarado was wounded on his left thigh, remaining handicapped for the rest of his life. He abandoned the war and appointed his brother, Gonzalo de Alvarado, to continue the task. Two subsequent expeditions were required the first in 1525, followed by a smaller group in 1528, to bring the Pipal under Spanish control. In 1528 the conquest of Cuscatlan was completed and the city of San Salvador was established. Topic. Titles and first marriage On 18 December 1527, the King of Spain named Alvarado as governor of Guatemala, two days later he granted him the coveted military title of Adentado. Alvarado's close friendship with Cortés was broken in the same year, Alvarado had promised Cortés that he would marry Cecilia Vázquez, Cortés' cousin. Alvarado broke his promise and instead married Francisca de la Cueva. Francisca de la Cueva was well connected at the royal court, being the niece of Francisco de los Cobos, the king's secretary, and a member of the powerful noble house of Albuquerque. This marriage gave Alvarado extra leverage at court and was far more useful to his long term interests. Alvarado thereafter maintained a friendship with Francisco de los Cobos that allowed him access to the king's favor. In 1528, by coincidence both Alvarado and Cortés were in Seville at the same time, but Cortés ignored him. Francisca de la Cueva died shortly after their arrival in America. Alvarado remained governor of Guatemala until his death. He was made Knight of Santiago in 1527. <inaudible> Peru By 1532, Alvarado's friendship with Hernán Cortés had soured, and he no longer trusted him. At this time Alvarado requested permission from the king for an expedition south along the Pacific coast, to conquer any lands there that had not already been claimed for the crown, and specifically rejected that Cortés should accompany him. In 1534, Alvarado heard tales of the riches of Peru, headed south to the Andes and attempted to bring the province of Quito under his rule. When he arrived, he found the land already held by Francisco Pizarro's lieutenant Sebastián de Belalcazar. The two forces of conquistadors almost came to battle, however, Alvarado bartered to Pizarro's group most of his ships, horses, and ammunition, plus most of his men, for a comparatively modest sum of money, and returned to Guatemala. <laughs> <laughs> Governor of Honduras In 1532, Alvarado received a royal cédula naming him governor of the province of Honduras. At that time, Honduras consisted of a single settlement of Spaniards in Trujillo, but he declined to act on it. In 1533 or 1534 he began to send his own work gangs of enslaved Africans and Native Americans into the parts of Honduras adjacent to Guatemala to work the placer gold deposits. In 1536, ostensibly in response to a letter asking for aid from Andrés de Saraceta, then acting governor of the province of Honduras, Alvarado and his army of Indian allies arrived in Honduras, just as the Spanish colonists were preparing to abandon the country and go look for gold in Peru. In June, 1536, Alvarado engaged the indigenous resistance led by Sicumba in the lower Alua River Valley, and won. He divided up the Indian labor in repartimiento grants to his soldiers and some of the colonists, and returned to Guatemala. During a visit to Spain, in 1537, Alvarado had the governorship of Honduras reconfirmed in addition to that of Guatemala for the next seven years. His governorship of Honduras was not uncontested. Francisco de Montejo had a rival claim, and was installed by the Spanish king as governor of Honduras in 1540. Ten years after being widowed, Alvarado married one of his first wife's sisters, Beatriz de la Cueva, who outlived him. After the death of Alvarado, de la Cueva maneuvered her own election and succeeded him as governor of Guatemala, becoming the only woman to govern a major political division of the Americas in Spanish colonial times. She drowned a few weeks after taking office in the destruction of the capital city Ciudad Vieja by a sudden flow from the Vulcan de Agua in 1541. Death in the Mixton War, 1541 Alvarado developed a plan to outfit an armada that would sail from the western coast of Mexico to China and the Spice Islands. 
At great cost, he assembled and equipped 13 ships and approximately 550 soldiers for the expedition. The fleet was about to set sail in 1541 when Alvarado received a letter from Cristobal de Oñate, pleading for help against hostile Indians who were besieging him at Nochistlan. The siege was part of a major revolt by the Mixtan natives of the Nueva Galicia region of Mexico. Alvarado gathered his troops and went to help Oñate. In a freak accident, he was crushed by a horse that was spooked and ran amok. He died a few days later, on July 4, 1541, and was buried in the church at Tirapetio, a village between Pátzcuaro and Morelia in present-day Michoacán. Four decades after Alvarado's death, his mestiza daughter Leonor de Alvarado Zicotencatl paid to transport his remains to Guatemala for reburial in the cathedral of the city of Santiago de los Caballeros de Guatemala, now Antigua Guatemala. Family After the death of her husband, Beatriz de la Cueva maneuvered her own election and succeeded him as governor of Guatemala, becoming the only woman to govern a major political division of the Americas in Spanish colonial times. Alvarado had no children from either of his legal marriages. His life companion was his concubine Luisa de Tlaxcala, also called Zicotencatl or Ticubalsi, her original names after Catholic baptism. She was a Nahua noblewoman, daughter of the Tlaxcalan chief Zicotencatl the Elder. Luisa was given by her father in 1519 to Hernán Cortés as a proof of respect and friendship. In turn Cortés gave her in guard to Pedro de Alvarado, who quickly and unremarkably became her lover. Luisa followed Alvarado in his pursuit of conquests beyond central Mexico. Despite never being his legitimate wife, Luisa de Tlaxcala had numerous possessions and was respected as a doña, both for her relationship with Alvarado and for her noble origin. She died in 1535 and was buried at the Guatemala Cathedral. With Luisa de Tlaxcala Pedro de Alvarado had three children. Leonor de Alvarado y Zicotengaticubalsi, born in the newly founded Spanish city of Santiago de los Caballeros, who married Pedro de Portocarrero, a conqueror trusted by his father-in-law, whom he accompanied during the conquests of Mexico and Guatemala. Portocarrero participated in numerous battles against the Indians. Leonor married a second time, to Francisco de la Cueva y Guzman. The Alvarado fortune remained with their descendants for generations to come. In the family of Villacreses de la Cueva y Guzman, governors of this part of Guatemala, Pedro de Alvarado, named for his father, who disappeared at sea when traveling to Spain, Diego de Alvarado, el Mestizo, who died in 1554 in the civil wars of Peru, by other women, in more casual relationships, he had two other children Gomez de Alvarado, without further notice, Ana Anita de Alvarado. References in modern culture He is portrayed in Lou Wallace's novel The Fair God. One of Montezuma's daughters falls in love with him in a dream before she had ever seen him. When they do meet he returns her love and gives her an iron cross necklace so she can convert to Christianity. She is killed during the Battle of La Noche Triste. C.S. Forrester's 1937 novel The Happy Return, set in Central America in 1808, features a character El Supremo who claims to be a descendant of Alvarado by a fictional marriage to a daughter of Moctezuma. Pedro de Alvarado is a character in the opera La Conquista 2005 by Italian composer Lorenzo Ferrero, which depicts the major episodes of the Spanish conquest of Mexico in 1521 and the subsequent destruction of the Aztec civilization. Pedro de Alvarado is identified as the torturer of Sinacon, the narrator in Jorge Luis Borges's story, The God's Script, La Escritora del Dios, first published in 1949. <laughs> <laughs> Ancestors <laughs> See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes Topic References Topic Sources Topic Further reading Topic External Links Works by or about Pedro de Alvarado in Libraries WorldCat Catalog 
Alvarado family genealogy in Spanish Alvarado y Contreras family genealogy in Spanish <laughs>